good morning everyone. So today we're going to be, well, I'll talk to you a little bit about osteomyelitis, uh, which as we know is uh, infection of the bone. Um, so just going straight into it. So epidemiology and etiology of osteomyelitis. Um, the locations that are commonly affected include vertebrae in adults and long, bone, long bones in children. And then in different high risk uh, patient groups, there are other um, locations as well as you can see. Risk factors for osteomyelitis include things such as penetrating injury tra or trauma, um, recent surgery, people who are immunocompromised, IV drug users, uh, people with poor vascular supply, systemic diseases such as diabetes and sickle cell, and those with peripheral neuropathy. Now, most cases are bacterial, and the mechanism by which um, the infection occurs is by three different ways. So hematogenous, direct inoculation, and contiguous. So as you can imagine, hematogenous is usually due to um, bacterial or viral systemic illness that's spread, and Staph aureus is the most common uh, organism there. And then direct inoculation, as you can imagine, a penetrating injury just directly into the bone can in introduce infection. Um, contiguous includes things like um, a nearby wound or nearby surgery and then just local spread. Um, and that can be bacterial, mycobacterial or fungal as well. And then I guess uh, the other thing to note is that organisms can change by the sort of age or risk group. Um, and bacteria, um, when it's introduced to the bone, they attach to the substrate and they create a matrix for a biofilm, um, which allows the bacteria to enter a sessile phase, which makes them quite resistant to antibiotics, which is why this disease is quite a hard one to treat with um, antibiotics alone. Um, so just showing this image here um, a bit bigger, this is how the biofilm is created in a stepwise manner, um, which accounts for why antibiotics can um, sometimes not treat the disease. So just moving on to clinical features. So we classify osteomyelitis by acute, subacute and chronic. So within two weeks, one to several months and after several months. And we have this classification system which um, describes the anatomic involvement, host treatment and prognosis of the disease. So as you can see there, depends on like where it is in the bone and the host type. Um, and moving on, so a patient may come to you complaining of um, a few things. So firstly, severe pain. This pain may be non-specific. It may be constant and can be worse at night. Um, however, obviously those with peripheral neuropathy, such as the diabetic patients, um, they may not have pain at all. You can also have fever, which is more common in acute osteomyelitis, um, and malaise and fatigue. On examination, you may expect to see tachycardia, fever and hypertension, particularly in those who've had hematogenous spread and who are septic, you'll look for those signs. Um, and then just on inspection of the bone or the, um, the limb or, where it, or the spine, um, you may see erythema, there'll be tenderness, you may see edema, you may even see a draining sinus tract, and that's more common in chronic osteomyelitis, um, scars, wounds, and then stigmata or concurrent infection. They might come in with a limp, um, especially with weight bearing in children, um, and there may be signs of vascular insufficiency locally or systemically. And here's um, just an image of a man who suffered an open tibial fracture, um, who had intermittent discharge of pus from the anterior of the tibia for many, many years. So that could be um, how osteomyelitis presents. Some differentials just to consider so on the left, uh, particularly in children, include septic arthritis, um, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, transient synovitis, and slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Um, and there are just some uh, notes about sort of the um, demographic you might watch this for and the investigation you might conduct for that. 
And then on the right, just again, traumatic injuries. We always want to rule out bone tumours, so um, screening for that. And then other infections such as necrotizing fasciitis, cellulitis, and then reactive arthritis as well. Um, so then moving on to investigations. Um, so first line, you'd think to do some blood tests. So we do a full blood count, CRP and ESR. And in the full blood count, looking at white cells. However, it's quite a low specificity in osteomyelitis and it's only raised in about a third of patients. So definitely not the most specific test. Um, but ESR and CRP are good markers. And particularly in treatment of osteomyelitis, um, it's said that we look for a decrease in ESR to that gives that's reassuring for the treatment. Um, the aim of pursuing so the aim of doing these investigations is to pursue a microbiological diagnosis um, to facilitate like tailored antibiotic therapy. So we would want to do a few things to detect um, the organism. So blood cultures obviously, however, only fifty percent will have a bacteremia. Um, if they have a sinus tract, you can culture it if it's discharging. Um, and then an X-ray, in, probably in the first instance, just because it's quite quick and easy to order. However, it does have poor accuracy, and you may it does it does have poor accuracy, but you may see things such as um, osteopenia, periosteal thickening, and then um, joint effusions, and things such as a sequestrum or an involuc. Volucrum. So a sequestrum essentially is the part of bone where the bacteria has gone and it's all necrotic and it serves as the nidus for the infection. So that's the point at which the antibiotics, if they're failing, they really can't penetrate that point. And then the involucrum is the formation of new bone around that infection, which makes it even harder to treat. Um, then second line, we turn to MRI, which is the best test for diagnosing early osteomyelitis and localizing infection. And the gold standard for the diagnosis is culture from the bone biopsy, which is typically done at debridement. Um, so obviously, if someone's septic, we can't delay antibiotics. We'll need to treat them with broad spectrum. However, if they're not, we want to balance the invasiveness of the test with the need for an accurate diagnosis. Um, so this can be done by open bone biopsy or fine needle. Um, and yeah, usually just take three samples for microbiology and histology. Um, and you want to consider uh, culturing for mycobacteria and fungi in patients who, you might, who might be from endemic areas um, or with other clinical features. Um, so that's just demonstrating, so the initial side of the infection, you can get a uh, subperiosteal abscess, and this is the sequestrum um, with, oh sorry, you can't see my mouse, but the sequestrum with the involucrum around it, um, and then that draining sinus tract with the pus coming out as well. So moving on to management, obviously start IV, broad spectrum antibiotics for septic patients, um, but if not, we would admit, and the typical antibiotic to start is IV flu clocks. Um, usually antibiotics are sufficient to treat acute bone infections. Um, if we've made the diagnosis within a few days of the symptom onset, if there's no dead bone or abscesses present on imaging, if there's a rapid response seen to them, that will be sufficient. And if there's no septic arthritis, so they're sort of the criteria to just leave it at antibiotics. Um, obviously, consider analgesia. However, if the patient deteriorates or there's evidence of bone destruction, we turn to surgery um, to manage this patient. And there's two options, so irrigation and debridement or amputation. And as you can probably guess, irrigation debridement um, is reserved for those for whom we can um, adequately like debride the necrotic tissue, um, all the soft tissue as well around it, um, and then amputation for those whose limb or wherever the infection is, is um, not salvageable. Um, and then just a table on the right from the e-therapeutic guidelines stating um, how long people should be on antibiotics for. So as you can see, it is quite a long time. And um, 
So for example, acute osteomyelitis in an adult, we need four weeks of intravenous antibiotic therapy, which is like, that's quite a long time. And then a minimum of six weeks of total antibiotics. So then they can be swapped to oral. Um, yeah. And so then just finally, complications of osteomyelitis obviously include sepsis and mortality. In children, if you have an infection in the bone, it can disturb their growth of that bone. Um, recurrence of infection, so despite surgical debridement and long-term antibiotics, recurrence rate of chronic osteomyelitis is actually 30% in adults, which so it's quite significant. Um, and uh, malignant transformation can occur in 1% of chronic cases. Um, and then, sorry, just another point, but poor, there's quite poor prognosis in patients with major nutritional or systemic disorders, as you can imagine. So that, yeah, that's the summary. So um, firstly, suspect acute osteomyelitis in an unwell child with a limp or an immunocompromised patient. Suspect chronic osteomyelitis in adults with a history of open fracture, previous orthopedic surgery, or a discharging sinus. Diagnosis requires careful assessment of radiographs, MRI, and determining the organism via biopsy and cultures. And treatment is often a combination of culture-directed antibiotics and surgical debridement. Thank you.